All right. How many of you guys love Jesus? Man, me too. Have a seat. Thank you guys so much for being here. Hey, we're kicking off our campaign today, Miracle of Mercy. And I want to thank you so much for being here. Let me just say this. In about two minutes, we're going to have a lady who is very passionate uh, for life. She's going to come out and give an announcement. And she's going to talk a little bit about abortion. Just wanted to let you know that she's coming out in, in about two minutes to make that announcement. A couple weekends ago, we had Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, and it snowed. So we didn't have Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And uh, just with everything that's going on, the decisions in New York and the legislation that's coming out here in, in Virginia, and it's a pretty hot topic, you know, lots of people talking about it. You know, we've always been a church that stands for life, and, and um, you know, we're passionate about that. And there's a lady in our church who has been connected with CareNet for 11 years. She's now on the executive team. She literally handles all church relations. She's the church relations coordinator for them. Uh, they are doing absolutely amazing work. Uh, we are also a church that stands for healing. Now, there's an awful lot of people that get sucked into that, and they're told things that aren't true, and, and they deal with a lot of hurt. And so we're, we're all about that, you know, uh, people healing and um, I want to thank our ushers. Our ushers are there waiting for me to say something. I apologize, you guys. They're going to move. I'm just looking at them, and I'm thinking, man, I need to say something about that. Um, and let me just say this. I cannot thank you enough for being the generous church that you are. You guys are so generous. I can't thank you enough for your faithfulness and for your giving. And, you know, we, you know, have, we've just been blessed. We've been able to buy land, build buildings. There's a lot of churches that have started around the same time we've started, and they're still in schools. But because of your faithfulness and because of your generosity and, and coming out to church and giving, we've been able to buy land, build buildings. We've been able to not just do ministry here in Haymarket, but literally all around the world. We support missionaries all over the world. And uh, we're able to help in, in times of need because of you and because of your generosity. God is using you. So here's what I wanted to do. I wanted us to give a big old Park Valley welcome to Kirk Gillespie. Good morning, family. Oh my gosh, I love my church. And I am so blessed and grateful for a pastor who is passionate for life and is bold enough to speak life and truth from the pulpit. Do you agree with me? Yeah, it's awesome. So you may be saying, well, what's CareNet Pregnancy Resource Centers? You may not be familiar. I'll start with our vision because it's, it's a powerful vision. Our vision is that every man and woman struggling with an unplanned pregnancy would come through our doors and be transformed in Christ. We are a medical center, but we're also a ministry. And we get the experience of seeing miracles of mercy almost every day. We welcome the abortion vulnerable client in our doors. We welcome her with love and never judgment. We offer a lot of free services, including free pregnancy test and free ultrasound. That's huge because when a client sees that heartbeat, which by the way starts in tw at 21 days, when that client sees that heartbeat, 86% choose life. We've had, yes, amen to that. We've celebrated 105 babies, um, at least that we know of, that were born, not in our center, but because of, of seeing their baby's heartbeat from our center. And we're very, very excited about that. We offer options counseling with truth. We offer lots of resources, and we do prenatal classes for free. So we have a lot of things that we can do to, to show mercy, and we, we really are excited about that. But our, our greatest miracle of mercy is that our priority is to share the good news of Jesus Christ with every single client. And so we've seen at least 45 people in the last year accept Jesus as their personal savior right there at our center. Yeah, yeah. The sad news is that it's still, um, it's still a tough world out there, and our, um, what's happening in the last couple weeks are making it a, a little bit tougher. In the last year, our statistics tell us that almost 100 surgical abortions were performed per month in Prince William County alone. 
And I know that that affects a lot of people. And with this abortion pill, which is very widespread, we don't even know how many that affects. Just last Thursday, we had a woman come in. She's in her 40s, champion for life. And she came in to see the center and find out if there was a way she could volunteer. And she told us a story that many years ago when she was very young, she took the abortion pill. She said it was a traumatic, traumatic effect. And even to this day, 25 years later, she's still suffering from adverse effects from taking that pill. So we want to know, we want to we wanna believe that there's a lot of women that are hurting, that are still being affected. In fact, national statistics tell us that one out of three women in the church have had a, an abortion. So we want to extend that miracle of mercy to the many hurting women who feel like they're all alone. And we want to help them find healing and restoration in Christ. We have a fabulous, powerful, life-changing abortion recovery Bible study that we offer to help women come to terms with that and, and be restored. And so everybody, we've, had, we've already today had so many stories. So women are, women are telling their story and they're using it. Their test is becoming their testimony. I know this, in light of what's been happening, what Satan meant for evil, God is intending for good. I am seeing a sleeping giant being awakened. Do you know what I mean? People are talking about it, and people are not afraid to say, wait a minute, God's people are saying, enough. This is just too much. Enough. It's not for the woman. And so we are, we are really about getting on those battle lines and making a difference. And so I, I also feel like politics has hijacked the whole issue. Would you agree with me? This is not a political issue. It's a spiritual issue. That's right. And the destroyer wants to come and destroy the souls of this nation, and we can't let him do that. So if you are heartbroken about what's happening in Virginia and what's happening across this nation, please come out to our table, get a newsletter, find out maybe how you can volunteer or help, and um, we will together, we're going to make a difference for life, right? Thank you. Thank you so much. I love y'all. Hey, everyone. My name is Matt. Thank you for joining us today. Men, we've got some exciting events coming up for you next month. We've got a men's breakfast on Saturday, March 2nd, where you can come and share a meal with other men and hear from a guest speaker. And then, on March 15th and 16th, we'll be sending a group to Lynchburg, Virginia for the Men's Ignite Conference. You can find all the details on the men's ministry page on our website. As we start our campaign, Miracle of Mercy, it's our goal to go out and meet the needs in our community. The way we're doing this is through our connect groups, so it's important that you're a part of one. You can go into the lobby after service and pick up a book and sign up to either host or be a part of a connect group. There's all kinds of things going on at Park Valley Church, and we'd hate for you to miss out. So be sure to check out the events page on our website or go to the info bar in the lobby. You can also download the Park Valley Church app. We're so glad you're here today, and thank you for being a part of what God's doing here at Park Valley Church. How's everybody doing? Good? I'm doing good. I'm doing really good. Happy Thank you. Happy Sunday. Um, so everybody has this desire to connect with God. We all do. Everybody does. And the reason for that is because, um, you know, God made us, you know, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But the fact is, sometimes people get angry at God or they get bitter at God, and the reason is because we have this ability to have this simple logic in our life that basically says, God's in control of my life, my life stinks, thanks a lot, God. And that's what people think a lot of times, and I've thought it, I mean, everybody thinks it. I'm a pastor, and I've thought it, you know, God, how could you do this? Why would you let this happen to me? This just doesn't make any sense. And so... Some people take it to the point, though, where they say this. They say, God, you're dead to me. They'll say that. 
Basically, there was a guy by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche who made that statement. He was a philosopher in the 1800s. He was a German philosopher. And what did he say? He said, God's dead, right? Some people also take it to the point where they say things like, you know what? God, as far as I'm concerned, you don't even exist, you know? And, um, you know, basically it's rooted in people that are angry or people that are bitter at God, you know, for whatever reason. And I'm saying, been there, done that, we all, we all get to that place in our lives. Sometimes we make the statement, look, you know what, as far as I'm concerned, I'm an atheist. But even though people say those things, and even though people believe those things, the truth of the matter is they crave God. They crave Him. And the reason is because He made us. Over in Genesis chapter 1, in verse number 27, the Bible says that God made man. He created man. Now, it's not just talking about men, it's talking about men and women, because at the end of the verse, it talks about men and women, but it says, he created man, and when he made man, he made him in his image. So he made people in his image. In other words, he made, him, he made people like himself, you know? And, um, you know, because of that, when he made us that way, he made us with a craving for him and a desire to know him. And so, um, I think about Psalm 139, it goes even further. It says things like God literally knit us together when we were in our mom's womb. So literally God is involved in all of that process while you're in your mom. You know, he's doing that. And, and that whole knitting together process talks about this, you know, this intricate, detailed process that happens, you know, when you're in your mom. And so everything about you, a sickness that you have, you know, a talent that you have, the way that you look, uh, the weaknesses or the strengths that you have, all of those things are by design and there's a purpose and a plan for everything. Even the things that you could potentially go through in your life that you would never ever want to go through, things that you would never ever choose, things that you, would, you wish that were not a part of your life, that you were the farthest thing, you would never do it in a million years. God all along is saying, look, I'm allowing this in your life and I want you to trust me through it. I just want you to trust me because I'm going to use it in ways that are amazing. So I don't think it's necessarily my job to go around and prove to everybody that, you know, there's a God and God's real. I'll prove it. You know, like that's my job. I have to prove that God's real to everybody, you know, or whatever. And, and God did that at times. There were times in the Old Testament that stuff happened and everybody went, are you kidding me? I don't know if they said that, but they were basically like, oh, there is a God. Remember when David killed Goliath? And he made that statement at the very end. He said this, now the whole world will know. I don't know if he had a British accent, but he's like, now the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. Yeah, because an amazing miracle took place. And everybody said, yeah, there's a God. You know, but I think my job, rather than proving that God exists to people, I think my job is to go alongside people and just love them when they're angry or love them when they're bitter or love them when they're hurting or whatever. What are those, what, what's that called? It's called an act of mercy. It's called me coming alongside somebody who's having a difficult time, you know, choosing maybe not to believe in God because there's a little anger there, there's a little bitterness there because of maybe something that's happened in their life and it's not me swooping in and debating them. We have this statement at our church. It says persuading people through love to follow Jesus, not persuading people through debate. I will persuade you through fighting and conflict to follow Jesus. I'm just gonna, you're not gonna, it's not gonna work. The only way you persuade people to follow Jesus is by loving them and showing mercy to them. And, you know, the, the truth of the matter is, anytime mercy's involved, somehow, some way, a miracle is gonna happen. That's why it's a miracle of mercy, because those two things literally just go hand in hand. Jesus is on the cross, and an executioner, Roman soldier, looks at the cross and says, Surely that was the Son of God. Those weren't just words. Those were words, but they were connected to a heart that believed. That was a miracle. Why? Probably, well, because there was an earthquake. I mean, trust me, that was a big part of it, I'm sure. But it was also because Jesus uttered the words from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. Hey, he, he had to be the Son of God. That was a miracle of mercy that took place in a man's life. Same thing with a guy by the name of Saul, who became Paul, who became the greatest missionary that ever walked the planet, who gave us about half the New Testament. Why? Because he heard a guy who had blood pouring down his face after they were throwing rocks at him to kill him, saying, Lord, lay not this into their charge. That touches lives. That's mercy. 
And normally, when somebody shows mercy to an opponent or to an adversary or to somebody who is an enemy, let me tell you what follows. A miracle follows in some way, shape, or form. And so you say, what's the process? The process isn't that hard. It's not hard. The process is, number one, I believe that God is real. I believe that God exists, okay? That's the process. And so, um, you know, we, we believe that God is real. We believe that God exists. And, and that's, not a, that's not hard. It's not a hard thing to do at all, you know, um, to believe that God is real. Uh, the next step is just to, to, to have a relationship with him. You have a relationship with him when you believe in his son, Jesus. And you believe that he died on the cross for your sins. And you believe that he rose again three days later from the dead. And, you know, the, the bottom line is the, the Bible says if you believe that, that Jesus died for your sins, that he rose three days later from the dead, and that he did it to conquer sin, death, and the grave, the Bible says he will save you. He will save you. He will change you. He will make you a part of his family. You have a relationship with him. The very thing that you've craved. The third thing is you submit to his authority. And you just trust him. You come up under the authority of God. And you trust him. You say, well, you know what? I'm not really a trusting person. Well, I'm not either. But don't sell yourself short. You're trusting. You trust a lot of people. You know, you, you trust the pilots to fly your plane. You trust the chef that makes your meal that he's not spitting in it or I don't know, or that he's doing a good job of it. You always, they always say, never tick anybody off in a restaurant, right? Because you never know what's going on in the kitchen. So you trust the person on a two-lane road that's coming your direction that they're going to stay in their lane. I mean, who, when you go onto a plane, you're getting ready to walk on the plane, you go, you know, before I step on the plane, can I see the pilot for a second? Why? I just want to ask him a couple questions. That's all. So how long have you been flying? Have you had any reprimands, any problems? Have you ever committed a crime? <laughs> Nobody does that. They'd take you away in handcuffs if you probably if you did that. The truth of the matter is you trust them. So here's the deal. If you can trust your surgeon, if you can trust your pilot, can you trust the God of the universe? Can you trust him? That anything, the, the, the things in your life that you view, hey, you know what? This is a bad thing. This is a good thing. This is a win. This is a loss. This is a triumph. This is a tragedy. You know what? Whatever it is, however you view it, God's got it. He's in control, and he's able to be trusted. I love 1 Corinthians 2, 9. It says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, mind, minds haven't even begun to comp comprehend what I have for you after this. And what we do is, is we hold on to this. This is my life. This is my status quo. I've got to have this. No, this is everything right here. And God's going, you don't even know. I mean, your eye hasn't even seen, your ear hasn't heard. No mind's even, it would blow everybody's mind what comes after this. And this illustration is a bad illustration, but the only thing I can think of is, you know, I've had an opportunity to go to the Philippines, and I went to the Philippines, and I'm in Man Manila, which is, by the way, a really, really big city. There's millions of people, between 16 and 18 million people in one city. There's people on top of people. Talk about a city that never sleeps. Two o'clock in the morning, there's traffic like you wouldn't even believe. Everybody is constantly moving in Manila. And so this guy, we're at a meeting, and this guy says, I want to take you to my house. And he said it in Tagalog, so somebody translated, and I said, okay, let's go. So we went to his house. He lived in a place called Dantubo, which is a slum in Manila. And he went and he showed me his house and I walked into his house and I'm going to tell you, a lot of people understand this, I'm sure, but a lot of people have no clue how other people in the world live. I mean, it's, it was amazing. It blew me away. And he just, with a smile from ear to ear, was showing me his home. And first of all, picture heat that is just oppressive. And the humidity is oppressive and sweat is pouring down your face. And you walk into this place and there's a dirt floor. And it's half the size of a single car garage. And then he says there's a slit in the wall. And you can look back there and it's just pitch black. But on a dirt floor, there's an old mattress laying on the floor. That's the bedroom for the entire family. Their whole family sleeps on that mattress. 
And he's just showing me, this is my home. This is where I live. And he's smiling from ear to ear. And I walk out, and his daughter's there with her friend. And they've got their arms around each other, and they're just smiling. And they're holding on. This is what we have. And as an American, I look at it and go, I don't, you don't even understand how other people live. I would never say it, but I thought it. Think about God saying that to everybody in Northern Virginia, saying, hey, you know what? You don't even understand. You're holding on to all of this. It's nothing. You know? And so what's he telling us? Romans 8, 28, I'm working all things for your good. All things to, for your good to those that love the Lord and those who are called according to his purpose. The last thing is, you know, then, then what do I do? Then I use the gift or I use the life that God has given me to accomplish the purpose that he gave me. Can I just say this? There is no better way to live your life. There's no better way to live your life than to fulfill the, the purpose and the plan and the job that God has for you. There's no better way to live. And then I've told you this story before, but it really wrecked me. This story really hit me. When, you know, years ago, I used to door knock. I used to go knocking on doors, just walk into a neighborhood, drop all up into a neighborhood, start knocking doors and saying, hi, my name is Barry. Will you come to our church? And they would go, <laughs> and I would go, go to the next door. Hi, my name is Barry. Will you come to our, I didn't do it like that, but I would try to do it a little better. <sighs> but been there, done that you know, going door to door. <laughs> Knocked on this one door. This lady came out and she said, oh my word, would you do me a favor? Would you go visit my father-in-law? He's dying. I said, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to do that. She gave me the place where he was. He was in a facility there, in a, in a kind of a nursing home facility. So I went over there and actually he, he was in Birmingham Green, which was years ago in Manassas. And I went in there to see him. And as I walked into his room, he looked at me. I'll never forget his face. He said this. He goes, God sent you to me, didn't he? First words out of his mouth. And I went, yes, he did. (laughs) I said, I'm going to go with that because I like that. I remember sitting down next to him and I opened up my Bible and I shared the gospel with him and he accepted Christ as a savior right there laying in bed. Two weeks later, I got a call from his wife. His wife called me and said, hey, we're all here at Prince William Hospital and I just wanted you to know that my husband died. And that he just loved you and he loved the fact that you came by to see him and, and everything. Would you come by and pray with us? And I said, absolutely. So I got in the car and I went over to the hospital. The whole family's around the bed and he's laying there in the bed. And I, you know, just we put our arms around each other and we prayed. And after I prayed, I, I just thanked them and, and said, we love you guys. And I walked out of the room and the wife came out of the room down the hallway, grabbed me by the arm. And she said, I thought you would like to know his last words. Last words he said was this. Twice he said, I see beautiful gates of pearl. I see beautiful gates of pearl. And then he died. And as I walked out of the hospital that day, I promise you I had tears pouring down my face because I'm a baby anyway. But I had tears pouring down my face and as I'm walking out of that place, I thought to myself, I know for a fact that this is exactly where God wants me to be and I know I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do. That's how I felt at that moment. Trust me, I've had a lot of other moments where I haven't felt that way because I've done stupid <laughs> stuff, all right? I know this is not what God wanted me to do. All right, so I've been there too. But I can tell you, there is no better feeling in the world to be exactly where God wants you to be, doing exactly what God wants you to do. It is the greatest thing in the world. And let me just say this. Every single solitary one of us were created for something more than just ourselves. If you are the center of your life, then you're going to be miserable. You were created so that you could be a servant. You were saved so that you could serve. You were shaped so that you could serve. Everybody sitting in this room today is a minister. And you sit back and you say, oh, now that's where I have a problem. You are the minister. You do the ministry. That's it. You know, I don't know. I was going to say something else, but I didn't know what to say. So... People freak out sometimes when you, when you think about being a minister. They freak out about it. Here's a simple definition of what it is to be a minister. Simple definition. You take the talents that God has given you and you help someone. That's it. That's what a minister is. We've got a guy in our church that is an amazing plumber. I won't call him out because his phone will ring off the hook. But you know what he does? He helps people with their plumbing issues. That's what he does. And he's good. 
Okay, he's real good. He's a plumbing minister. Because he takes what he can do well, and he helps people, and he serves people. We have HVAC ministers in our church. We have cooking ministers in our church. We have auto mechanic ministers. We have financial planning ministers. We have counseling ministers, medical ministers, attorney ministers, engineering ministers, IT ministers, real estate ministers. Literally, all it is is this. I'm going to take the gifts and the abilities that God gave me, and I'm going to use them. I'm going to use them to help people. And anybody who does that is a minister. We're a church full of ministers. We have so many opportunities to help people. And what's another thing to call any of that? It's an act of mercy. And anytime there's an act of mercy, there's the potential for a miracle. In your small group lesson coming up this week, or if you had it this past week or whatever, you're going to hear that one of the greatest attributes that God possesses is the, is the attribute of mercy. He's a merciful God. And the reason we're teaching that is because, because God is merciful, and he has made us, and he wants us to be like him, he wants us also to be merciful. This is what he says. Luke chapter 6, verse 35 and 36, he says, love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Let me just tell you this. If you lend money to your enemies, you're probably not going to get it back. So the Bible's amazing. It just tells you that straight up. And then it says, then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. And then it says here in verse 36, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. He showed mercy to you. So the bottom line is, I would ask this question, who are the most qualified people to show mercy? People that have been shown mercy. And we sit and we talk about qualifications. Maybe you sit back and you think, well, okay, well, I'm not, I feel unqualified or I feel disqualified. People feel unqualified because they feel like they don't have any abilities. They feel disqualified because maybe they got something in their past that God is mad at them and God doesn't want to use them anymore. Listen, nothing can be further from the truth. You have life, you have gifts. God's not done with you. He wants to use you to advance his kingdom. He wants to use you to spread mercy all around, just like he gave to you. So the first part of the message is just the word. And the second part of the message is I want to talk about the goals of our campaign. But I want to close with this verse on the, the scripture part. It's a really long verse. And what I did was, is I underlined all the parts I wanted you to see and really, really focus on. You see, it starts off by talking about how we used to be. And then it says that God showed us mercy. Mercy's in the middle. And then when mercy gets involved, everything changes. All bets are off. There's miracles that happen in everybody's life. You see, what the Bible says is this. It says, before we had God's mercy, and before he touched us with his love and his mercy and his forgiveness, the Bible says we were foolish. The Bible says we, we were disobedient, and we were misled, and we were slaves to lust, and we were slaves to pleasure, and we were full of evil, and we were full of envy, and we were full of hatred. And I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but that word, that, that is a, a really awesome but. I don't know if I should say that in church, but <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing but, all right? Because it really, really changes the whole, you know, I don't know, the whole message of, of this verse. But when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things that we've done, but because of what? Because of, his, because of his mercy. And when his mercy was evident in your life, when he showed his love and his mercy and his forgiveness and kindness to you in your life, you went from all of that to being washed and having a new birth and having a new life and having the, the Holy Spirit of God generously poured out on you and being declared righteous and now having confidence and now having eternal life. That's a game changer. That's a miracle. And it's happened in every single one of our lives because of the mercy of God. And the God of the universe says to all of us, after I've given you so much mercy and I've done a miracle in your life and I've changed your life, how can you not go out and spread it? I mean, the bottom line is, if you're loving your enemies and you're lending money to them without expecting it back and being kind to them, all you're doing is setting yourself up for a miracle. Because God's mercy 
is absolutely amazing. Over the next six weeks, we're going to be focusing on the mercy of God. And we've got certain, basically for us, here's what a campaign is. The word campaign for us means focus. That's what it means. For the next six weeks, we're going to focus on the things that are the most important. And we've set goals in all of the most important areas of our lives as a church. And there is no way in the world that we're ever going to meet any of these goals unless this church gets behind it and says, you know what, we're in. We're all in. We're going to meet these goals together as a church. Our first goal is very simple. We would like to see 100 people come to faith in Jesus. 100 people come to faith in Jesus. And you're like, okay, so how can I help there? I mean, that's between them and Jesus. You can help. There's three things you can do. The first thing you can do is you can make a prayer list, and you can put two or three names down on a prayer list where you can pray for people that need Jesus. You can pray for people that need Jesus. And, you know, I have a prayer list. I put it in my Bible. And what I do is before I read the Bible, I just pull out my prayer list. Or after I read, I I go through my prayer list and pray for people. You know, you can do the same thing. Let me ask you this. This is kind of a feet to the fire part of the message. How many of you guys would say this? I'm going to make a prayer list. I'm going to put two or three people down on that prayer list or however many people. And I'm going to pray that people come to faith in Jesus over the next six weeks. Would you raise your hand and say, I'll do that? Wow. Man, there's going to be a lot going on because prayer is powerful. We're going to see some amazing things happen because of your prayers. There's a second thing you can do. The second thing you can do is you can invite people to come to church. Just invite people to come to church. It's not a weird thing. I heard a stat the other day that said 82% of people would go to church if somebody just invited them. That's crazy. Most of the time you think people are going to just start screaming and they're going to go, no. Ah. They probably, they might just come to church. Here's what we're going to do. On March the 9th and the 10th, which is the weekend right before the last weekend of the campaign, we're going to take March the 9th and the 10th, and I'm going to make sure that there is a message that I preach that is about salvation so people can hear the message of salvation and accept Jesus Christ and be given an opportunity to accept Christ as Savior. So we told you and we asked you, we said, hey, it's Christmas Eve. We're going to give the gospel. We're going to give people a chance to get saved bring people. You know what? You brought 8,000 people to that. So you guys are awesome. You know what you're doing. I don't know that we'll have 8,000, but I don't know where we'd put them, but the fact of the matter is bring as many people as you can from March the 9th and the 10th because we're going to give them an opportunity to hear the gospel and accept it, to accept the mercy of God. It's a miracle. It's a, it's a life changer. It's a game changer in people's lives. We're also going to be talking about baptism that day. But you can uh, bring people with you to church. The last thing you can do is you can share the gospel with somebody. Now, did every, if you got one of these, wave it at me. It's a, the good news cheat sheet. That's what I'm calling it. Did you get that? Okay, good. I want to make sure you got it. You may want to say, you know what? Yeah, I'll invite them to church. Yeah, I'll pray. But I'll give them the gospel myself. I like that. So what we thought we would do is just give you a tool. And this is just six points that may resonate with people. Like, for instance, the first one. We know deep down that there's more to life than just this life. That's why everyone at funerals say their loved one's in a better place. I've been doing funerals for 28 years. Everybody says that. They're in a better place. Why would anybody say that? You know what? Nobody has ever walked up to me and said, Hey, you know what? Uncle Sam has been completely and totally annihilated. (laughs) No one ever says that at a funeral. They always say, Uncle Sam is in a better place or whoever it may be. And so, why? Because in the back of our mind, we know there's more to life than just this life. So you can walk them through this uh, process of six things. And I even put the prayer at the end. You know, why not? So you may drop a prayer in Starbucks or whatever. Lead somebody to Jesus over coffee and right in Starbucks and, you know, Park Valley invasion of, of wherever. So, and if, by the way, if you lead somebody to Christ, we want to hear about it. Number one, we're trying to get to 100. I know it's weird, but we're trying to get to 100. And, but we also want to hear your story about how you shared Jesus with somebody and they accepted Christ. The next goal is this. We want to see 100 people baptized in the next six weeks. That's a lot of baptisms. We baptized 259 people in all of last year. So we're basically asking, we'd almost like to do half of that in six weeks. You know what that's called? That's a God goal. That's a God goal. So 
Step number one is this. If you're sitting in our church right now and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've believed in Jesus as Savior, but you have not been baptized yet by immersion, hello, you can help us. Just be obedient. Just do what God told you to do. You're like, hey, relax. I just, you know, need some answers first. Great. You know, we'll talk to you about whatever you need to talk about. We'll try to give you answers, you know, about baptism for sure. So be praying about God giving us 100 people being baptized. Here's the third goal. We need 120 small groups. 120 new small groups. We already have 120 groups. We want to double our groups. So we want 120 new small groups. Now here's the thing. As of before Saturday night, we've had a ton of groups started between now and then. I won't tell you the number. I don't even actually know the number. But, so I can't tell you. But what I would say is this. Before Saturday night, we had 60 groups, new groups that had started. Now, I'm not a math whiz, but 60 is not 120, right? And if I want to get to 120, what do I got to have? I got to have 60. So I'm praying that God give us 60 new groups this weekend. You're like going, you are insane. Maybe. But you know what? God can do it. Being a group leader is the easiest thing in the world. You know, and I shouldn't have even used the word leader. Like, oh, leader, I'm a leader now. Here's the deal. All we want people to be is hosts. That's all we want. The host is an acrostic. The H in host stands for have a heart for God or have a heart for people. Now, if the H for you is I hate people, then it's probably not for you. <laughs> okay? That's fine. Not a big deal. We'll put you on coffee or, or whatever. Not a big deal. But if you have a heart for people, okay, then this is for you, okay? The O stands for open up your home. How many of you people, don't raise your hand for this, how many of you people think that God gave you your house for your ego? He didn't. He gave you your house so that you could open it up to advance the kingdom in some way, shape, or form. He gave you your house so that you could invite people in and bring people in to make a difference for the kingdom. And so we just want you to open up your home. The S stands for serve a snack, you know, or make some coffee or serve some coffee or whatever. It's really simple. And the T is probably the most technical one because it's turn on the DVD player. Okay? That's all you need. You don't need to be a, have everyone that's been through seminary. No, we're not asking that. We just want people that love people, people that will open up their home, people that will serve some kind of refreshment, people that will turn on the DVD player. Literally, that's it. It is so easy. And you know what? You don't need people in this church to populate your group. You're like, okay, well, I'll do it. Now fill my group up with, you know, wonderful, popular people. No, that's not what we're doing. Go to some coworkers and say, hey, you guys want to have lunch together for the next six weeks every Monday in the break room? We're going to eat our peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and then after that, we're going to watch this guy named Rick Warren teach for us for 20 minutes, and we're going to talk about it. Anybody want to do it? Just get two or three people. You can do the same thing with family. You can do the same thing with neighbors. You can do the same thing with friends. You can, it's, it's, it's not hard to do. As a matter of fact, here's what I'm going to do. You wondered why I had these stairs here. Because Saturday night, I was jumping down, and Garrett said, I'll hook you up with some stairs. I said, thank you. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take the first one. I'm already in a small group right now that's doing this. But I'm going to take the first one, and I'm going to let you know this. I'm going to go around, and I'm going to go door knocking again. I got some bad memories, but I'm going to go door knocking in my neighborhood, and I'm going to ask my neighbors, Christine and I are going to host another group at our house, hopefully, Lord willing, Monday nights, and hopefully somebody's going to show up. They may look at me and say, I'm not doing that, you know, or whatever. That's great, but I may have a couple neighbors that come and come to the house, and you know what they're going to find out about? They're going to find out about the mercy of God. You know what they're going to find out about? They're going to find out that God can do a miracle in their life. So here's what I want to do, because this is put your feet to the fire section, all right? I want to ask you this question. Who in the house, who in the room right now would say, Barry, I'll join you, and I'll do the same exact thing. And what I want you to do right now is I want you to get up out of your seat, and I want you to walk down here to the front. I want you to take a bag, and I want you to hang out with me. And in just a few minutes, there's going to be a ton of people moving. So what you need to do is get, get moving fast now, because there's not going to be a lot of room in the aisles I know it's going to happen. So what's going to happen is, is everybody that says, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm scared to do this, but I'm going to at least try. Nobody may show up at my group, but I'm going to try. 
and I'm going to walk up there right now, and I'm stalling right now because nobody's moving, but I'm still talking. <laughs> Pastors are the best stallers in the whole world. And so right now, thank you. We got people coming right now. I'm going to ask you to come. If you will come and say, you know what? I'm going to grab a pack. We got to get 60 groups this weekend, and I'm going to give it a shot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, keep it up. Keep moving. Keep moving. I love this. I love this. This is awesome. Just get two or three coworkers. Two or three coworkers. I had a lady come up to me a little while ago, and she said, you know what? What if I just get my whole family together? I said, praise the Lord. Yes, do it with your whole family or whatever. Thank you so much. Just keep coming. Keep coming. We got plenty of time. We still got people coming. This is amazing. Grab a bag. Inside the bag is a book a DVD, and um, an information card on who you can call when you feel like you don't know what you're doing, all right? Because we will walk you through everything that you have, every question that you have. If you guys wouldn't mind coming over near me, I want to just circle up real quick, and I want to have a prayer right now. Anybody else want to join before this prayer? Yes, we got another one. Got somebody in the back. Got some more people coming. That's good. Come on down. Come on down. This is wonderful. This is awesome. Grab a pack. And, and walk here to the front. Still got people coming. Might as well leave it open. We got time. It's only 10.29. I'm technically seven minutes and 32 seconds over, but that's not a problem. <laughs> we got time. We got an hour between services, so I love this service. A lot of fudge time. Anybody else? Yes, we still got people coming. Anybody else? I can, let me tell you what's going to happen. Can I just tell you a quick story that just popped into my head? Check this out. We did this back in 2004, in 2004. And there was this family sitting in there. I I stood up in front of everybody and I said, if you want to start a small group, stand up. You know, that's what I said. And um, Shirley Dominic kind of just punched her husband and said, stand up. (laughs) He's like, I'm not standing up. Stand up. He went, and he stood up. Well, I'm going to tell you what happened through that group. You guys know what happened through that group. Because that group got formulated and because they had a burden and a passion for for veterans who were wounded warriors, they started an organization out of that small group called Serve Our Willing Warriors. And now there's 40 acres and I think three different houses over here or two or three different houses over here that are housing wounded warriors now because of the faith of standing up. What these people are going to see, they're going to see miracles. They're going to see miracles. So what I want to do is, if we could just circle up real quick, we'll just say a quick prayer. Just circle up, and we'll just say a quick prayer, and we'll do that real fast. (sighs) Father, God, thank you so much for what you're doing today in this service. Thank you for these people that are willing to get up out of their seats, walk in front of everyone, (laughs) and say, I'll try. I'll try. I'll give it my best shot. God, I believe what they're going to see is is they're going to see miracles. I pray, Father, that they will. I pray, Father, that you would give them wisdom. I pray, Father, that you would give them direction as to who to ask to be in this group. If it's just two people in a group, it works. God, I pray that we would see just some incredible lives changed. And Lord, because because of the faithfulness of these people, direct their groups, give them wisdom, strength, power, and might, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much. You guys can have a seat. That's awesome. Great. So the last thing is this. The last thing we're trying to do is this. We're trying to create a Saturday night culture at our church. We're trying to create a Saturday night culture. And right now, our Saturday night service is just jamming. I mean, there are so many people coming to our Saturday night service. We have some more things that we're planning to do with Saturday night that I'm not going to announce just yet. But the reason we want to create a Saturday night culture is because The two optimum times to come to church are 9.30 and 11.30. Those are the most optimum times. Most everybody outside of this church, if they're going to visit this church, they're either going to come at 9.30 or they're going to come at 11.30. Now, most of the time, we don't have problems seating people. we got seats. We just don't have any parking. That's what's hurting us. So what we're doing is is we have a, a satellite lot over at Reagan Middle School, and we run shuttles every 15 minutes. If you ever want to take advantage of that, it's a, it's a real pain in the neck. It really is. But, but the fact of the matter is, 
God didn't call us to be comfortable, right? God called us to sacrifice. God called us to do whatever it is we can possibly do to make sure we get people in these doors so that they can hear about the gospel of Jesus and they can actually experience the mercy of God that you've experienced. We need them to experience it too. So what I wanted to do was ask some 930 people, some 1130 people to at least think about and pray about possibly diving into that Saturday night culture. Now, I'm not asking you if you'll go. I'm not saying who will go. I'm not saying that. But I am going to ask you this. Who would pray about it? Who would just pray about it? Raise your hand if you pray about Saturday night. Okay, good. It's good. That's a lot of people. So that'll help us because we want to be able to have the parking spaces and the seats and all to bring into these optimum services. We don't really have any other, cho- any other choice but to grow. We've got to keep trying to reach people for Christ. Thank you for being that kind of church and getting it and seeing the big picture. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a minute? Let me just say this. There's a simple yet powerful story that changes everybody's life who believes in it. It's called the gospel. God sent his son, Jesus, so that he would die on a cross, so that he would pay for your sins. Literally, he did it for you, specifically for you. That's the mercy. That's how much he loves you. If you're here today and you don't know for sure that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, I'm going to tell you, now is the time Now is the time for you to believe. Now is the time for you to accept Christ as your Savior. And I'm going to give you a chance to say a simple prayer right where you sit. Just whisper a prayer to God. And I know some people are like, I like the prayer. I don't like the prayer. Whatever. I always say this. At Park Valley, we're just doing our best. We're just doing our best. We're just trying to point people to Jesus. That's it. And so if you're here today and you would like to accept Christ as your Savior, why don't you pray this simple prayer in your heart? Why don't you pray this? Dear Heavenly Father, I want you to know this from the bottom of my heart. I believe. I believe, not because I see, but because I have faith that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and that Jesus rose from the dead three days later. I believe it. I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. I pray that you would make me a part of your family and change my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, let me ask you real fast. Without anybody looking, how many would say, hey, Barry, I just now prayed that prayer. I received the mercy of God. I gave my life to Jesus. I believe that he died and rose again. I just prayed it. Would you raise your hand high? Wow, that's awesome. Awesome. Anybody else? Just say, yeah, that's me. I prayed it. I meant it. I accepted Christ as my Savior. Just raise it high. It's awesome. You can put them down. Father, thank you for what you've done in this place. Thank you for your word. Thank you for a church that gets it. People that are just off the cuff making a commitment to start a group and they're just doing it blindly. It's called faith, but they're going to see miracles. God, I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray for every person that just accepted you as Savior, that you will strengthen them. And I pray for all of us that will be channels of your mercy. That's what you called us to do because you've shown us so much. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for watching. We're so excited for what God is doing here at Park Valley. If this ministry has had an impact on your life, then join us in reaching others by going to parkvalleychurch.com and selecting the giving tab. Or you can download the Park Valley Church app, which has an easy way to give. It will keep you up to date on upcoming events, and you can even stream our service. Thanks again for watching. We hope you have a great day.